Hello, welcome back uh, to session two of Mango and the Neural Engineering Framework. Um, so, what are we going to talk about now? So, in the last series of, uh, yeah, so in, in the last session that I recorded, um, we sort of covered what neural algorithms look like. What do we mean by that? We covered a particular theory, the Neural Engineering Framework, of and its claims about what types of algorithms um, neurons would be good at implementing. And the idea is that if we can sort of examine that class of algorithms and build cognitive theories out of that class of algorithms, um, then we can build models that are more easy uh, to tie to biology, more connected to biology, um, and it might give us very different insights into very different classes of algorithms to think about. So. Um, from the stuff that was covered in the last lecture, what do neural algorithms look like? The idea is um, that each um, group of so each group of neurons, uh, group uh, neurons work together to form a distributed representation of a numerical vector, so um, a set of numbers. Um, so uh, you might have a hundred neurons that are representing, say, a, um, a an x y value, a two dimensional vector. Um, and then each connection between groups of neurons, um, by adjusting the connection weights, you can have those connections between groups of neurons compute functions on those vectors. Um, and I also sort of briefly mentioned that not only when does it compute a function on those, um, on those vectors, but also the dynamics of the synapse are going to sort of end up applying a bit of a temporal filter, some sort of smoothing of that data over time, that's going to become very important uh, in this lecture. So we'll be spending more time on that. Um, but the particular details of what functions the neurons are good at and what types of filters that you get um, depend on the biology, depend on the neuron model, depend on what's going on at these synapses. Um, and this forms a nice place where there's a connection between the low-level biology and the high-level algorithms. Um, and the types of functions that are easy to compute are that the neurons can, can do well are, are sort of surprising. Um, you know, just because a function is easy for us to write, like, you know, find the maximum of two numbers, um, that might turn out to be something that's really hard for neurons to approximate, whereas something that's really complicated, like sine A plus B times cos B minus A, um, uh, might actually be really simple. Um, and what that's going to come down to um, is um, what, what sorts of functions these neurons are good at approximating, um, and for a lot of neurons, um, the answer to that question is going to be smooth functions. Um, so functions where small differences in the input do not cause small changes or large changes in the output. Um, and another way of phrasing that is functions that are well approximated by low degree polynomials. All right, so that's summary of the previous um, session. Um, we sort of introduced some graphs like this, saying that neurons are good at this function approximation idea, um, that uh, what we're going to be thinking of as a group of neurons is this group in the middle, so the, the blue things there, those are the actual neurons, and then this encoder and decoder idea that we introduced, this is sort of, this is a, a mathematical abstraction that we're using to build our model, um, but... Um, uh, but that these encoders and decoders don't technically exist in the brain anywhere. Um, they're going to disappear when we turn it into a biological model, which is on the next slide. Um, but the general idea is going to be very similar to a, a standard single hidden layer neural network. Um, I have some sort of input. That's the vector these neurons are representing. Um, so in this particular case, I have five neurons that are representing a three-dimensional input. So there's a three-dimensional vector coming in. The five neurons are forming some sort of distributed representation of those of that input. Um, that's what the, the encoder connection weights are doing. Um, and then the decoder connection weights, um, the connection weights are coming from the hidden layer of the neurons to the output. Um, so we're now computing some function or some, some value y that's coming out of this. Um, y is some function of x, y is two-dimensional, x is three-dimensional, um, and that decoder is um, pulling out um, whatever particular function is that we want, and if we want a different function, then we can change that decoder. Okay. Um, so that's, again, not particularly controversial. That's a standard hidden layer neural network. Um, that's just the same thing said over again. 
Um, the fun trick that we talked about is that, hey, okay, these encoders and decoders that I just talked about, um, well, they don't actually exist in real brains. Um, uh, because you don't have something like these, you know, perfect nonlinearity or these, these perfect, um, perfectly linear things, X and Y. Um, you know, if, if you have groups of neurons in the brain, they're connected to each other. They're not connected to some intermediate thing in the first place. And so if we want to actually map our models onto biology, it turns out all you have to do is take that D decoder weights D and the encoder weights E and multiply them together um, and you get a connection weight matrix. And that's the connection weight matrix that will be exactly the same as the decoder and encoder combination. Um, so that's how we're going to build up larger models um, and have those models, the internals of those models, still be biologically realistic. Um, and so that will let us build a model that is, you know, where each step computes a function, computes a function, and computes a function, and we can map everything down onto the biology. The one thing that I kind of didn't focus on much um, in that last slide, uh, in, in the last lecture, is that, well, hold on a second, when there's connection weights between neurons, that's not just perfectly just take the output from a neuron and multiply it by the connection weight, and that gives you your input to the next neuron. That's not how biology works. Well, let me rephrase that. That's not how most of mammalian biology works. Um, there are certainly some some ty types of neurons, particularly uh, commonly in insects, um, and even some in mammal brains, that yes, do actually work like that. The vast majority of neurons in mammalian brains, when a spike happens, neurotransmitter is released. That neurotransmitter is what causes current to flow into the next neuron, and that neurotransmitter is gradually reabsorbed. So that introduces some sort of uh, introduces a temporal component um, that we got to pay a little bit attention to, and that we're going to exploit in this particular um, lecture. So um, the core idea in the math. So if we imagine that when a spike happens, neurotransmitter is released, and then that's reabsorbed. Um, the simplest model of that neurotransmitter um, uh, release, uh, um, when people model the neurotransmitter release and reabsorption, um, will often have some sort of um, canonical sort of, oh right, this is what one, you know, when one spike happens, this is what the current looks like. So this is sometimes referred to as the postsynaptic current. Um, if you want to, if that, that's what happens to one spike, if you build up a system like the way I've described here and just say, okay, solve for the connection weights using exactly what I've been talking about, um, find the connection weights that will compute some function, but then add in the, oh, okay, and we're going to have this, you know, every spike is going to cause an effect over time. Um, it turns out that when, then what happens is that if you've built the system to say approximate the function f of x, so z is some function of, uh, of x, what you end up with is actually that z is some function convolved with that same filter. So this h of t, if, if this is what one spike does, it turns out that if this is what happens to every one spike, the fact that that function is being approximated by many, many, many spikes just means that, okay, that same filter is being applied to everything, and that means that that same filter is being applied to your function. Um, if people are familiar with this sort of notation of, of applying filters to things, great. If not, the only thing really to think about um, is that um, it's sort of smoothing the output. So um, if you suddenly change x, z is not going to change all that quickly. Um, so we'll, we'll we, um, so we're gonna we're gonna go play around with that. We'll do some examples of that right now. Um, Mathematically, there's a whole, this this sort of notation of convolving functions together is very common in, um, yeah, in all sorts of engineering fields. So there's well-established math for this. We're just going to go and use that. Um, but let's first play around with some example. Um, okay, so we're, um, we've gone back to using Nango here. Um, I'm going to start a new example. Um, I've run it. And I'm just going to click here, and I'm going to save my file as, uh, I don't know, what are we going to call this one? Uh, uh, synapses. There we go. We'll start giving these files useful names. Because we're going to be talking about uh, what happens as we change the synapses. Uh, the, connect the temporal dynamics of the connections between groups of neurons. 
All right, um, so that's that. All of our functions are basically, or all of our Nango models are gonna start very similarly in that we're gonna have some sort of stimulus. We're gonna have some sort of uh, input ensemble, or this first ensemble that's just gonna take that stimulus. We're gonna have another group of neurons. Ensemble neurons is 50 dimensions. Sure, we'll have we'll have it the same number of neurons. Um, and let's do a da, 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 let's just do a nice normal connection between A to B. All right, so this is an example that we've done before. If, since I have not specified a function in here, the function that it is by default doing is the identity function. So I'm just going to show that. So I guess we'll probably want to modify that later. Or whoops, function equals my func. There we are. So that's the default. If you don't specify a function, it assumes that you want the identity function to go between these two. Um, and this is the sort of the example that we've done before. Um, so let's, as a reminder, um, oh, let's pull up spikes just so that we can go ahead and see it. Um, so we now have an input. I can pass values in to the system. I'm going to pause that and move back so that we can go and see that. All right. So I've been changing the input going into these neurons. This is the actual neural activity of those neurons. This up here is the decoded value. So a weighted sum of the activities that best represents its input. Same thing here. Um, and the connection weights between A and B were done by finding the decoder that best approximates this function and multiplying it by the encoders for the B neurons that were randomly generated. Okay, um, so this works. You very clearly see it's passing the information across. That's what we showed last time. The thing I want to focus on here is, well, what's happening when I suddenly change the input? Okay, that output does not change instantly. All right, this is the temporal aspect that I'm wanting to focus on in this uh, in this lecture. Okay, what's controlling that? Okay, the biggest thing that's controlling that, well, the main, yeah, the thing that is controlling that is these connections have um, filters on them have uh, the, the, that each of these spikes is not just causing an instantaneous change in the in the output. Um, each spike is causing um, a thing. Yeah, each spike is causing something like this in the output: the sudden jump up and then fade, fading back down. Um, Nango supports lots and lots of different postsynaptic currents like that, lots of diff different synapse functions. The default one that we're using um, is just an exponential decay. It's just uh, e to the negative t over tau. Um, so it's just it's the simplest synapse model um, that we're going to be using. Nango supports lots of other ones. Um, and the same basic theory that I'll be describing also applies to these more complicated ones. Um, so let's really, let's take a long, closer look at that, because um, every time I make a connection in Nango, I'm going to have something like that. But we can, of course, control that. So the default when I make a connection is that the synapse for that connection um, shoots up and decays back down in five milliseconds. So that's the time, the time constant of that uh, exponential decay. Let's really slow that down. So five milliseconds is sort of at the high end of what you find in brains. Um, you can probably get up to two, one millisecond, two milliseconds um, you can find in some places in, in, in brains. Um, but that's sort of like the fastest sort of synapse that you'll generally find. Um, the slowest sort of synapses are more like 100 to 200 milliseconds. So let's try that. I'm gonna so pull this synapse up to 200 milliseconds. Um, Everything in Nango uses um, SI units, so the units of the synapse are seconds. Um, so 0.2 is 200 milliseconds. Um, so that's so the only thing we've changed is that on these connections between A and B, when a spike happens, um, that causes release of neurotransmitter, and that is going to decay back down very slowly now. So I go ahead and run that. 
everything seems the same. I'm going to go ahead and change this input. And that takes a lot longer to go up. Okay. All right. So it's still computing the identity function, but it's computing the identi identity function that has now been smoothed over time by this long 200 millisecond. Um, it's mathematically identical to a low-pass filter. It's another way of thinking of this. Um, yep. um, and if you want to think of this as a low-pass filter, so for instance, if I start manually moving things around, okay, yep, look, it's computing the identity function. You know, B is the same as A. Um, but if I start doing this, yep, B is a much smoother version of A. That's the standard thing in engineering of why you might want a low-pass filter, is in order to smooth out really noisy data. So, um, that's one kind of weird thing that we're going to get um, whenever we, um, we have a connection that's using these sorts of biological release neuro, you know, have some sort of postsynaptic current that is caused by a spike. Okay. Um, and so we can include that in Nengo and we can mathematically characterize it as this, um, take the function that we've asked it to do and convolve it um, with a low pass filter. Um, I'm, the example I'm doing here shows that it works for the identity function. We're going to get the same sort of effect if I have, you know, if, if the neurons are computing some function. So here I'm computing the square. All right. And if I suddenly change the input, it'll gradually go up. If I suddenly change it all the way down here, right, you know, that's correct, minus one squared. All right, so there's there's no little you know there's a little tiny bit of a change there, but um, it is doing what we expect eventually. So it's like it'll get, it gets to the right answer, but it gradually moves there, and that's what we would expect if our answer is getting sort of a low pass is being smoothed over time with this sort of low pass filter, and by changing the time constant of the synapse. Um, I can I can change how quickly that happens. Right, so now, okay. okay, so that's much faster now. Excellent. So this is sort of this is getting us in the direction of time. Now, one thing this has already done is this is on. Oh, hey, cool. There's this extra computation that we get. Um, because of the fact that that synapse is there. Um, unfortunately, it's sort of a, it's really restrictive. It's only, the, it's just got this sort of feature sort of smoothing things over time. And the actual amount of time is just fixed by the neurotransmitter. Um, now, there are a lot of different neurotransmitters with different time constants in brains, and maybe this is an explanation why. Um, but actually, what we're going to do is we're going to take things a little bit farther, and we're going to exploit this timing in a very weird way as we get into recurrence. Um, but, um, okay, but the, the core thing of smoothing, of, of ending up with some sort of smooth system um, whenever we have a synapse is going to be really important in order to understand what recurrent connections are going to do. And that's going to be the focus now. So recurrent connections, what happens if a group of neurons connects back to itself? So Everything I've talked about so far, I can make a group of neurons, I can connect to another group of neurons, I can make the connection weights between those neurons approximate some function. Well, what's going to happen if I just connect a group of neurons back to itself? Right? And even then that's sort of, well, it's confusing. Well, what if, okay, so if the, the group, the neuron is representing, you know, the value x, and then I connect it back to itself computing some function x squared, then how, what what is that group of neurons going to end up doing just seems very confusing because um, there's no time steps there's no like like um it's hard it's hard to get a handle on what exactly is going to happen here now fortunately we can just run it right because we can just define the model i mean all, all the stuff i've said so far is just a weird way of con creating connection weight matrices so why don't we just create that connection weight matrix and run the system and see what the hell happens okay and of course, what's going to happen is going to depend on what function I'm computing on that connection. So let's try a couple. All right, I'm going to go back here. 
I'm going to say recur one. Yeah, recurrent, we're fine. Okay. All right. Um, same example. We've got A, we've got B. Um, and uh, da, 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 da. yeah, and we'll make we'll make a connection from B back to itself. All right. So let's get rid of this. Let's go from uh, A to B. That's all fine. Um, and then we're going to make a connection. So the recurrent function and x plus one. So that's gonna, we're just going to pick a nice simple function x plus one. Okay. Um, and I'm going to make a connection from b back to itself. Oh, using that function. Okay. So this first bit we totally understand as we just sort of move this slider that's going to change the neurons in A, then A is going to change the neurons in B, B is going to connect back to itself and something weird is going to happen. And that's exactly the question. Well, what is this weird thing that's going to happen to at B? Um, and if we sort of stare at it right now, I don't know, any guesses? What do you think is going to happen? Um, let's find out. I'm going to hit... All right, think for a moment, something, so so say zero is being sent in here, zero is going to be represented by this group of neurons, zero is going to be represented by B, a one is going to get represented by, going to come back along here, so this B is getting input of both zero and one, so B should represent one, but then a one, then that means a two is going to be sent back around here, and now B should represent two, so it feels to me like B is going to start, you know, the, the value represented to B is just going to shoot up. So I'm going to run this, and that's exactly what happened. Um, it didn't shoot up forever, right? And that's important because, okay, and that's, uh, again, something we talked about in the last session in that whenever you have a group of neurons, it's representing um, a vector. It's also representing a vector within some range, and that's the, the radius parameter um, that was here. The default radius is 1. So that's saying these neurons are optimized for representing values between minus 1 and 1. They'll represent values slightly outside of that range, but they're not good at it. Right? The neurons just start firing as fast as they can. They can't fire any faster. Um, the optimization to find the decoders was only optimized across the range minus 1 to 1. Um, so it's not going to do a great job of representing larger things, and generally what happens is it's just going to represent, if it's trying to represent a value of 2, it might represent a value of 1.1 you know, 1 .1 instead. Right. So we get this sort of saturation effect, that it, the value being represented shoots up, and now these neurons are just firing as fast as they can. Okay. But how quickly did it shoot up? How long did it take to shoot up? It took, you know, a couple of milliseconds. What controlled that? What affects that? How could I modify that? Any suggestions as to what I could do in order to modify, in order to say, make it shoot up slower? Okay. Well, one thing I could do is this x plus 1. Let's tell it to approximate a different function. Let's tell it to approximate that function. Okay. So now... That should mean, so it's, that's just all that's happening here is now we have slightly different connection weights on the recurrent connection on B. Um, and and that should um, shoot up uh, a little bit slower. So run that, let's find out. And it did. A little bit slower. Okay, what else could I have done to go and modify this to adjust its timing? Well... I did just do a little bit of a spiel on synapses, so let's change the synapse. So again, the default synapse is 5 milliseconds. If I make the synapse a longer time constant, so let's say 50 milliseconds, that means, again, when a spike happens, it releases neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter is going to stick around longer. That's going to mean that we are... The um, whenever a spike happens, it's going to continue to have effect into a longer time into the future. 
So that means this neural population is going to be a little bit more resistant to change. That means we're going to have this slowing down, this, again, this low-pass filter effect, this smoothing of what's going on. And there we go. So now it goes up nice and much more slowly. And then again, hits the threshold around 1. And so it doesn't go up any faster, any farther. Okay, so the synapse is affecting these dynamics. Okay. All right. So sort of hand wavy. We can sort of vaguely, you know, it's doing something that's vaguely understandable. We're going to want to get some sort of mathematical understanding of what's going on. We'll get that in a moment. I want to do a couple more examples. Let's do this example. Let's do minus x. Okay. But again, all I'm changing is what's the um, recurrent connection um, going to do, or is the connection weights on the recurrent connection. And they're just finding the connection weights that best approximate that function and putting it back into itself. So what's that going to do? All right, let's see if we can imagine this again. So if we feed in zero, we're going to get zero here. We're going to get zero here. Negative zero plus zero is minus zero. Ooh, so if we just feed in zero, we should get zero coming back in here. Um, uh, and so B should stay at zero. Cool. What if we feed in a one? Well, if I feed in a 1, and this is a 1, so this is going to be coming out, this is going to be a minus 1, we're going to have 0, what's, you know, what, what, what's it going to do in that case? Um, all right, that gets a little, that seems like it'll be a little bit more confusing. We'll go see what's going to happen. Some people, when I ask that question, one common suggestion is that, oh, well, what this population is going to do is it's just going to start oscillating between zero and representing zero and representing one, representing zero, you know, it's going to start um, uh, varying, varying back and forth between that. Right? If I feed in a one, initially it'll represent a one, but then it's going to feed back that minus one back here, so then it's going to represent zero, then it's going to represent one, then it's going to represent zero, then it's going to represent one. Um, so that sort of fast oscillation is a, is a common suggestion. Um, what's it actually going to do? Okay, well, first of all, if I feed in zero, I get a zero out. All right, that's good. That's sort of what we expected. If I feed in a one, I get a 0. 0.5. That's a little odd. Why is that? <laughs> all right, it's sort of, you know, it, you know, it does mathematically kind of make sense in that if I feed in a one, um, and if this is currently representing 0.5, then minus 0.5 is coming back along this loop. 1 minus 0.5 equals 0.5. Right, so that is a nice stable point. Um, indeed, in general, it should represent um, half of whatever that input is. Um, if you want, you can... Well, so uh, one way to think about what's happening there is that the value in B... So the, the value being represented in B um, is um, whatever my input is, uh, we'll call that, I don't know, input, um, plus the value in B fed back to itself, so that's minus B. All right, so that's mathematically, that's, you know, what this thing is trying to claim, is it's doing, All right? And if we do do a little bit of rearranging on that, uh, what that means is, 2b is the input, all right, um, whoops, um, which means b should be the input divided by 2, all right, so, all right, so it's doing something that seems vaguely, um, that seems to vaguely make sense, but there's still some unknowns here, like if I quickly change my input, what the heck, why does it overshoot and come back, what, Huh? <laughs> All right. So okay, and it's sort of okay. Well, this backwards feedback is on a slower time constant because it's at 50 milliseconds. So and whereas the input is at five milliseconds, so we can sort of see that okay, the compensation that's coming back here is going to happen after slower than the input, but it starts getting hand wavy at this point it would still be good to sort of understand what's happening in a little bit more of a mathematical sense. 
but it's still doing something vaguely understandable. Um, one last example, x squared. Okay, again, all we're doing is we're changing the recurrent um, uh, values on there. All right, what's this going to do? Again, we're feeding in a zero. If we feed in a zero, we're going to get a zero. We're going to get a zero. Zero plus zero is zero. Everything should be fine. What's going to happen with other inputs? I feed in zero. Everything's all good. I feed in a large input. Okay, all right, that's fine. With a large input, I've got a you know some large value coming in here. I've got the square of that value coming back along here being added to it. Cool. All right, we're going to get some large number. That's fine. And then we're hitting the saturation so it doesn't go up even higher. Um, all right, and if I pull it down, if I pull it down, if I pull it down to sort of some negative, some smaller number, all right, that's fine. Okay, so this is just representing that number. The square of that number is going to be something positive. So that's being f fed back to itself, so it should be things seem to be a little higher. So this all seems fine. But there's an interesting behavior here. So for instance, right now, I'm feeding in an input of some relatively small input, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, something like that. We're getting something a little bit higher in the memory. Then I'm going to go up here, and then I'm going to come back down. I'm feeding in 0.2 again. Actually, I'm feeding in 0.19. And it's still at a much larger value than it was. All right, so my input is around 0.2. Let's make it exactly 0.2. My output is 1. I go down here, and then I bring my input back up to 0.2. My output is not 1 anymore. Now my output is 0.3. What? Why? How? <laughs> This system is now a system that has memory, all right? So its output is not just dependent on the input, okay? The output is dependent on the past history of, of, of the system, okay? This is sort of the first thing that you would need if you would start wanting to build up some sort of memory. Um, and it's also the first indication of, oh, there's something we can now do with recurrence that we could not do at all with the feed for functions, with the functions we were prox um, we were building in the previous examples. Um, if all of the examples we showed before, the output was purely a function of the input. Okay, we're here now we have a situation where it's also a function of its past history. So there's going to be something about the recurrence that's going to give us new capabilities. It'd be great to actually understand how this is working and whether or not we can really understand the dynamics of what's happening here. All right, so much for just playing around with it. Let's go and figure out what the heck is happening here. All right, um, this is going to be a page of math. Uh, we're going to step through it. Um, the um, Yeah, we'll step through the math. Um, the nice thing is there will be a punchline at the end. So if you like the math, cool, enjoy it. Um, the nice thing is going to be there's a punch, there'll be a punchline at the end. Um, that will uh, just summarize everything relatively nicely. Um, so, okay, so um, what happens with recurrent connections? Um, okay, let's start with what happens with a feedforward connection. All right, I said that every connection you can approximate some function, and that function is also going to get smoothed over time by convolving with the postsynaptic current. And here I've drawn out what the shape is of the um, standard low-pass filter postsynaptic current function. Okay. All right, that's what happens in the feedforward case. What's happening in the recurrent case? Well, what's happening in the recurrent case is now we've got this other function being approximate, whatever this function is that we're doing on our recurrent connection, and it's also getting smoothed by this low-pass filter because it also has synapses. So math ways, like we can just write down, okay, so this is what should happen to y, all right? It should be taking whatever function we've asked um, to go from x, um, you know, whatever function of x it is, and then we're adding to that some function of itself, and we're taking all of that and we're convolving with a low-pass filter. All right, so that's just math speak for what we've been talking about. And now all you have to do is you need to solve this. And all right, 
someone gives that to me and I'm just, I don't remember anything about math. Uh, you take it to your local mathematician and you say, all right, how do I deal with this? Um, and your local mathematician says, look, anytime you have an equation that has this convolution thing in it, get rid of that. There's two standard ways of getting rid of that. Um, one of them is a Fourier transform. The other is the Laplace transform. Um, we're going to do the Laplace transform because there's no particular reason to believe any of the stuff that we're talking about here is periodic, so we probably shouldn't use the Fourier transform. Um, but um, oh, and also the Laplace transform is going to work turn out really nicely because it's got a this shape here, this postsynaptic current thing. Yeah, that's one of the shapes that is in the back of the textbook of for all your um, when you learn about Laplace transforms in the back of the text of your textbook it has that page of here's a bunch of things in the Laplace transform yeah this is a, this is one of them so we're gonna do the Laplace transform all right Laplace transform you switch to capital letters and your variable in your instead of being things changing over time it's now things changing um, over this s variable um, and in the back of your textbook it says hey this particular shape the exponential curve um, this is its Laplace transform, where tau is the time constant of that um, low pass of that uh, exponential decay. Um, Math-wise, it's right, written like this. So the Laplace transform turns a convolution into multiplication, um, and everything else just converts over. But now that it's in this form, the convolution has gone away. Now we can do basic algebra again. Right? This is why the Laplace transform was invented. So do a bunch of um, rearranging and we can get it in that form and the reason i put it in that form is that s times a laplace fun uh, a laplace transformed function um also has a nice inverse laplace transform because i i have no intuitions about anything when i'm looking at it in the laplace transform space um but if you now do the um uh, inverse laplace transform i get this and this is now telling me exactly what the behavior of y will be. This is how y will change over time, given whatever function I specify on my recurrent connection, that's g, and whatever function I specify on my input connection, that's f. Right. It's saying the actual function I'll end up with is will be what, what I asked for, uh, or sorry, the derivative of y, how y will change over time, will be, well, whatever function I specified, um, minus the current value of y, plus, yeah, all of this weird stuff. What that then means is that if I have some particular differential equation that I would really like these neurons to approximate, if that's the differential equation I would like, then all I have to do is set my recurrent connection to being tau a plus y, and my input connection to be tau times b, and if you feed those things into this equation up here, you'll get this. So now, if I have some differential equation I want these neurons to approximate, this now tells me what um, uh, what functions I should specify when I'm solving for connection weights, and then the actual dynamics will end up being what I want. This is weird. This is a so first of all, this is a new capability of for neural network, right? So I can now. Um, instead of just having neural neurons approximate functions, I can now have neurons approximate differential equations. Right? Any differential equation I want, same restrictions are going to apply in that, um, you know, if the differential equation has really sharp changes in it, then the neurons are going to only going to approximate these functions. Um, and so you will might end up with um, smoother versions of the differential equations, fine. Um, so it can't perfectly approximate all functions, um, but we can... Um, as long as it's a smooth differential equation, everything should be fine. Okay, that's a little bit weird. Um, let's do a concrete example of this. Let's say that I have a group of neurons, and they have a really fast neurotransmitter. Let's say that they have a neurotransmitter <coughs> um, that... Um, decays with in something like two to you know five milliseconds okay. but let's say i want those neurons to act as a low pass filter i want those neurons to smooth the data over a longer amount of time than the biology actually has 
Okay, and that's maybe another way of thinking about what, about what we're doing here is we're exploiting the low-level dynamics of the neurons of the synapses, um, and we're exploiting those so that the synapses have some intrinsic dynamics over time. That's the the particular time constant of the of the, of the um, postsynaptic current. And then I'm and then I'm using that. I'm saying, okay, how can I take that into account when I make my recurrent connection weights in order to cause the system as a whole to have some other dynamic behavior. And in this particular case, the low-level dynamics is something like um, a time constant of 5 milliseconds, but I want my system as a whole to smooth data over 50 milliseconds. Okay? Um, all right. Um, this, for people who have taken courses in differential equations, this is sort of like one of, one of the sort of basic examples of things you can do with a differential equation. For people who are not used to it, I'm bringing up this example as sort of a uh, well, here's something you can do um, uh, just to start thinking of things in terms of differential, equa uh, differential equations. All right, so let's try implementing that. Um, all right, uh, so that this thing up here is the differential equation for a um, low-pass filter with um, a particular time constant. So the thing we're dividing by by, that's the time constant of what we want. Okay. Um, so uh, let's actually just do this as a sort of as a variable. Why not? So tau desired is going to be five milliseconds, but the ti tau time constant of my uh, synapse is five millisecond. Okay. So, there was that page of math. Um, okay, and our, oh, sorry. And our desired function is this uh, x minus y over point of zero five. Okay. Um, so, so desired differential equation is um, going to be um, the change in b with respect to time is. B minus A divided by tau desired. Right. Oh, whoops, I got that the wrong way around. A minus B. Right. Sorry, on this screen over here, I'm using X and Y as my as my two groups of neurons, my variables, whereas over here I'm using A and B. All right, so the rule that we just did this wacky math for says you take your differential equation that you want and have it in this form and then whatever and and the recurrent connection is going to be this function and and the feed forward connection is going to be this function what's that mean here okay let's worry about the feed forward connection first because it's simpler so the feed forward connection says, all right, take whatever part of your differential equation has x in it, has, has your input in it, and multiply it by tau. All right, what part of my differential equation has my input in it? Well, my input is this a thing, so a divided by tau desired. So maybe another way if I could write this is going to be a divided by tau desired. Um, minus b divided by tau designed. All right. It's the same thing, I just expanded out the parentheses. So we're going to take the part that has to do with our input, a over tau desired, and I'm going to say, hey, the function that I want to do here, def uh, my feed forward function, is going to be, um, all right, do this part. Fine, I'll use a as my variable name. doesn't matter what my variable names are. Um, so I'm going to say return a divided by tau desired. So that's the part of the equation that is that is part of my differential equation that has to do with my input. And then this is saying, all right, multiply that by tau. And so I'm going to do that, multiply that by tau, by the tau of my synapse. 
Okay, so that's that's the thing, the transformation that I'm supposed to make to my input. And then my recurrent function, oh, whoops, and then when I actually make my connection, I should do that. So function equals feed forward func. Good. And then in my recurrent connection, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to do the same sort of thing. So take the thing that has to do with my in, my my internal variable, the actual variable that's changing, that's part of the, that's in the um, group of neurons that we're doing the recurrence in. Take that part, multiply it by tau, and then add the value um, in that recurrent population. What do I mean by that? So my recurrent function, in this case it's now a function of b, um, is going to be a return so from up here, I have negative b divided by tau desired. Negative b divided by tau desired. Okay, so that's the part from my function. I then, so that's, that's for the, from the differential equation just says do that. And then the math that I just derived says, okay, from start with that, and then multiply by tau synapse, and then add b. Um, this is what I was saying that like there's just a, a rule to follow. Just take whatever your differential equation is, split it into these two parts. For your input part, multiply it by tau synapse. For your recurrent part, for the, the, the part of the variable that's actually changing over time, um, multiply it by tau synapse and add b. Okay. Um, t -t 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 oh. Two things, oh, and then I forgot, of course, when I made this function to also specify that synapse. Synapse equals tau synapse. There we go. Uh, and then my function is the recurrent function. Synapse is tau synapse. Okay. So what have I specified here? I have built something that has a, where the actual biology has a really fast time constant, five milliseconds. Okay. Um, but then my desired behavior has a much longer time constant. It's going to smooth data over a much longer period of time. Does this work? We're up there. And that went, that got up there a lot smoother, a lot more slowly. Down here. Again, it moved, changed much more slowly. Oops. Um, but it is... You know, if I go and do something, do lots of noisy input, you know, it produces a smoother version of it. And since I have it in these variables, I can go ahead and make things even longer. Let's go up to 200. Okay. Now, one thing you'll notice is it starts doing a poor job. Okay. Again, thing to remember, this is always... Um, all right, so it's sort of, it seems like it's trying to do what it wants. We get this slow change, but it's not doing a very good job of it. Um, one possibility is always that, hey, we're trying to approximate functions. The neurons just might not be doing a good job of it. We might need a few more neurons. So I'm going to go up to 200 neurons. Okay. Oops. And that's doing what we want now. And again, this can be a fun thing to go and say is, oh, hey, look, if you want things to a certain degree of accuracy, if you have this really, really, really small time constant, biology is now saying, look, if you really want to get something that smooth with a really short time constant, you're going to need a lot more neurons. Right? And we can go ahead and make predictions and figure out what we want. And this would why perhaps be why, you know, in actual biology, you might just instead say, all right, have a different time constant, right? Because if I have a time constant of 200 milliseconds, well, now we can actually see what, it's, what, what that looks like. It's about the same. Um, and you will notice that in this case, tau desired and tau synapse, if those are the same, go ahead and look at this math here. If tau desired and tau synapse are the same, tau synapse times tau desired, those are going to cancel out. Minus b plus b, this function is the zero function. So in this particular case, yes, of course, you don't need a recurrent connection because how does that, you know, if these things are the same, then it's just exactly what you're going to get. It's a nice double check that our math was right. Um, so that's kind of cool. So you can get, so 
again, the point of what I was saying here is that you can get, um, even though neurons, the neurons have very, very fast intrinsic responses, you can make the system as a whole have a much slower response or smooth data over time. You know, so it's taking up data. It's just it's, you can think of this as like it's it's outputting the average of of what its input has been recently. Sort of one way to think of what a low-pass filter is doing. So cool. So you can make um, neurons with very fast responses um, uh, behave as if they have um, are averaging over a longer period of time. So you can, you know, um, and you know we can even do things like. You know, even if the neurons themselves have sort of the upper limit of what you see in biology of, say, 200 milliseconds, you could say, okay, I want the system as a whole to have a full second for that. So now, now it's going to take a full second to get up there. All right, so you can start getting behavior that is outside of the realm of what um, biology can produce. Um, so that's kind of cool. But there's an interesting thing, because I've set these things as variables, there's an interesting thing that can now come up. What happens if I have a really long synapse, but I want it to behave as if it has a very fast synapse? Clearly there's going to be some things around, right? So how can you have a very, a very, very slow system behave, uh, respond very quickly? Right? That just seems weird. Um, but the math seems to say that it should be fun. Like there's, there's nothing in the math that says that the tau synapse has to be smaller than tau desired. So what's going to happen if we run this? I mean, something's going to happen. Um, it's not like the computer's going to explode or something. So let's try it. Okay. So the neurons themselves have a very, very, very slow response, 100 milliseconds. And I can change, make the input change, and it works fine. Trust the math, don't trust our intuitions. This is, so, like, these neurons, like, if I if I didn't have that recurrent connection in place, right, this is what 100 milliseconds looks like, right? That's the sort of slow response that the neurons in a feed-forward manner would be doing, okay? But now I'm not changing the neuron properties. The neuron properties are still that same slow response, and all I'm doing now is adding in recurrent connections in the B population, the second population, that let that population behave as if they're doing a much, you know, uh, or much faster responses to their input. Okay, it's not a problem. Highly surprising <laughs> um, that this is possible. <laughs> that you can build recurrent connections that cause slow, slow responding neurons um, to, be, to act quickly. Um, it's just what the math says. Works fine. Uh, that was a surprise to me the first time I ran that. I assumed that something would go wrong in the math, and certainly at some limit it does. So for instance, if I had incredibly slow neurons and I wanted an incredibly fast time constant, Uh, okay, well, we're starting to get it more noisy. It's incredibly slow neurons. All right, all we're getting is a little bit more noise there. Oh, I still have 200 neurons. If I had fewer neurons, this should behave pretty badly, I think. It's always embarrassing when the, when the networks work better than I expected. <laughs> There we go. We're starting to see a fair bit of noise in the response, but yeah, still working fine. Um, getting very fast responses out of very, very, very slow neurons. Cool. All right. So that's one basic thing you can do with um, differential equations. Now that you can implement differential equations, that's and that's sort of a nice trick. This isn't actually the one that is the most common that we're going to be, I think it's going to be, end up being useful. The more common thing that I think we're going to want, um, well, sorry, let me rephrase that. Differential equations are incredibly useful. There's lots and lots and lots of different applications of them. Um, but if you're not used to thinking in terms of differential equations, it's hard to come up with um, what one you might want. This is one that is worth knowing about and is the simplest and has a really nice form when we go in and bread it. And this is just 
the differential equation that is um, dy dt equals x. So what is that saying? That says, hey, look, if my input is positive, you know, I'm storing some value y. If my input is positive, then increase y. If my input is negative, decrease y. If my input is zero, then keep y, keep my input exactly as it is. Uh, mathematically, this is integration. This is saying uh, y is the integral of x. Take my input, add it together over time. Um, but if my input is zero, well, adding zero is going to mean that I don't change. Um, and if we go ahead and look at what this hap what happens when we go and implement it using the math that I just showed, what it's saying is our recurrent connection needs to be the, the identity function, the function that just takes um, whatever value is currently being stored and sends it back to itself. And then my input connection is just my input multiplied by the time constant of my neurotransmitter. Um, and that sort of makes sense in that, okay, look, that, that'll that be a system where if I'm feeding in zero, then whatever's in B is going to get, you know, whatever's in this population is going to get sent back to itself. Um, and so if I feed in zero, then this should just stay the same. And if I feed in a positive number, then this should go up. And if I feed in a negative number, this should go down. Um, and I've got this sort of scaling factor up front, this tau thing, in order to control how quickly it goes up and down. Um, so let's try building that. I'm going to call this recurrent two. Um, right. So this is a much simpler one. We don't have this tau desired thing. We're going to get rid of that. My feed forward function is just multiply by tau synapse. All right. So again, that's the rule. You take whatever part of your differential equation has the input in it, x, all right? And we're just going to multiply it by, um, so just take the input value, multiply it by tau synapse. Okay, now well, let's go, yeah, sure. Um, do, 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 that's fine. And then the recurrent connection, okay, take whatever part of your equation has y in it, and there is no y in that equation, so that'll be zero. <laughs> 0 times tau synapse plus b, or another way of writing that is just there. Okay. So again, this is just the identity function going from this back to that. Okay. And what this should be is a memory. I feed in 0. Oh, let's give it a few more neurons. Just to, I'll show off what was happening there with fewer neurons. Whoops. Come on. Go back here. If I feed in zero, it stays at zero. If I feed in a positive number, it goes up. If I feed in a negative number, it goes down. If I feed in zero, it stays where it is. Okay. This is a neural integrator. Okay. This is something that is very difficult to build using standard neural network techniques. Um, to me, the ability to build something like this, this is what was the, sort of the payoff of all the weird math that we've introduced in order to, um, uh, and, and this weird way of looking at, uh, neuron, at groups of neurons that I introduced in the previous session, um, that we can build systems like this, and all we're doing is we're just solving for connection weights that give us the particular dynamics we want. Right? And this is just one particular sort of dynamics that we might want. Um, these sorts of things are found in biology relatively frequently. So like the standard one that's been investigated for ages is the horizontal um, motor control system for the um, optic for, for eyes. Um, so for instance, um, yeah, so uh, and it turned because as it turns out in biology, there's a bunch of neurons that are um, basically controlling the position of the eye and their input is a velocity signal. So you, most of the time the input is zero. Sometimes you get a big pulse of input for one way, and sometimes you get a big pulse of input for the other way. Um, and um, and the point of that system is to integrate um, uh, over time, in that you're going to get zero. You know, most of the time you're holding the eye still, and then you get these sudden pulses that say move the eye there and then back. All right. Um, and um, yeah, and then so some of the early papers establishing the neural engineering framework 
um, we're about analyzing that thing and showing what sort of error rates you get and in goldfish you have 40 neurons doing this whereas in humans you have 200 neurons doing this and so with different numbers of neurons you get different accuracy and showing all of that sort of comparison right. um, I will also note when building these sorts of recurrent connections um, you'll notice that I used a long time constant 100 milliseconds if I use the shorter time constant it's gonna work oh actually you sort of saw a little bit of that right there at the beginning um, let's go ahead it down here oh wow <laughs> you will notice sometimes it just does not work at all all right uh, so with a very 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 low time constant or sorry with a, with a very fast time constant you often starts getting really harsh behavior all right you can always fix this behavior by adding more neurons it will always get better um, until you know, to whatever degree of accuracy you want um, but it basically the this for, the forward function ends up being such a smaller and smaller value um, that the noise in this recurrent connection starts being not enough to change it um, generally you will find that if you have wanting to do recurrent connections um, um, they will behave better with longer time constants um, interestingly a lot of recurrent connections in the brain tend to be fairly long time constants so it's also kind of a nice um, thing to go um, and as just as a rule of thumb as you're building models whenever you're building a recurrent connection give it a long time constant even if you haven't gone and looked up in the biology yet to see um, what the actual you know if, if you're trying to map your model onto a particular neural circuit um, um, oftentimes you can actually just find out what the data is um, and uh, but I will always pretty much always just by default start with a large number and then go check all right so we can store data over time and this sort of we can store one value again but again since everything is vectors this generalizes to two values three values four values um, in some of the larger working memory models that we've so this is the, the basis that we've used for working memory models in some of those models we've been up to 512 dimensions um, so storing large dimensional vectors using this sort of approach um, and the neurons tend to be very good at it you will note that these functions that we're computing here are incredibly simple functions they are linear functions these are things that neurons are really good at approximating so that also feels pretty good other things you can do for differential equations um, so so the main thing so if you're used to thinking of differential equations great I don't need to give you examples um, if you're not used to thinking differential equations the one thing to keep in mind is this memory so you can use neural networks to store memories you should also be aware of um, things like building oscillators so this is the other another standard thing that people do with differential equations is you go ahead and define functions that you know you don't even, you don't need to give it input it'll go ahead and create patterns over time okay um, there's some standard oscillators out there so here's differential equations for standard ring oscillator that is you know you you can go ahead and set what the rate is that it'll go around and so now this will be just a group of neurons that we can just sort of leave alone and they will go ahead and um, produce some value that oscillates at some rate okay. um, just in the interest of time I'm just going to go ahead and open those so Nengo, oh, and also to show off that Nengo has a bunch of built-in examples if you click the open button in Nengo you can go to built-in examples and then tutorial um, and we'll go down to oscillators okay um, this is an oscillator with this particular differential equation um, the text sort of describes what's what you can do with that and this is an oscillator um, that should uh, what are we going to do here yep uh, da, 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 da. go ahead what am I doing here it's oscillating around a very 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 small point let's pull up some spikes so we can actually see what's happening try that again there we are every time you run Nengo, oh, actually this will be good a uh, good reason for an example every time you run Nengo you get a it, when every time you run these a group of neurons it's randomly generating tuning curves sometimes you get tuning curves that are just doing a much worse job than normal of approximating a function 
Um, so you can just run it again, um, and you'll get a different uh, tuning curves. If you want to fix the random number seed that generates that, you can also specify a seed um, in the network parameter or in the ensemble. Uh, anyway, uh, what I was mean what I was meaning to show off, the only thing that we have here is a recurrent connection. There's no inputs to these neurons other than this recurrent connection. They just sit there a spike. Um, and you will get, um, uh, and we've asked it to approximate this differential equation. This is the behavior of the differential equation. Um, this is a sort of two different graphs of the same thing. Um, and so you have this neural activity that's pulsing at some rate. And if I want a different rate, all I need to do is go ahead and change the, uh, change the differential equation. And now I get neurons that pulse more quickly. Again, I haven't changed anything about the neuron properties. The only thing I've changed is the connection weights between the neurons um, to get whatever um, oscillatory rate that I want. Okay. So that's cool. We can make an oscillator. Let's be a little bit cooler. Because um, again, oscillators are something that people have built with neurons lots. Like you take any large group of neurons and you randomly connect them, you get some, you get an oscillator with some rate. It's kind of nifty that we can use that to sort of just derive the math that will give us the oscillation at the rate that we want. But let's do something a little bit cooler. Because we can approximate any differential equation, we can also approximate a nonlinear differential equation. So we can make, you know, if we have some big differential equation. Right. We can have one of those variables be one of the inputs um, to the group of neurons. What do I mean by that? So the os so if this group of neurons X, if we make it three-dimensional, and one of those inputs is the speed of the oscillation, and then the only thing I do to this differential equation here is I say, okay, instead of having that speed thing be some fixed value, I'm going to say, no, 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 no. It's that fixed value times whatever that other, times one of the variables being represented by my group of neurons. We can just go ahead and do that. Nothing else has changed, nothing, you know, and so what that should do is that should now be an oscillator where I can control the rate of oscillation by affecting the firing pattern in this group of neurons. This is a controlled oscillator. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So I can say, hey, go quickly. All right. And slow it down. So go a little bit slower. Go slower, go slower, go slower. And have it stop. I can have it go backwards. Have it go backwards quickly. Okay. I've got a fixed set of connection weights in these neurons here. Let me, let me just pull up some spikes just to actually show what's show this. I, you know, because again, all this is doing is perfectly normal neurons with connection weights between them, and we're just solved for connection weights in a really weird way. All right, all right. I've got my neurons here. This is their actual neural activity. These graphs here. This is just the a sort of a visualization of that neural activity by taking the weighted sums of these spikes. Same thing as we've seen before. Um, so this group of neurons is oscillating. You know, you can, and you can both see it in its behavior, and you can also just look at the neurons and say, oh, hey, look, they're oscillating at some rate. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to change the inputs to these neurons here. And now all of a sudden these neurons are not oscillating. Right? I can have them oscillating more slowly. I can change the rate of those these oscillations. I can stop it. I can go backwards in the pattern. This is a controlled oscillator. Um, this is something that is, um, you know, lots of people, again, people, have, you know, this is the sort of thing that you need if you want to be able to, say, swim at different speeds or walk at different speeds. Uh, if you have an oscillator that is creating your, your leg movement, you want to be able to control the speed of that oscillator. Um, and it's very hard to build um, that with other sorts of uh, neural network techniques. Um, the NEF, the Neural Engineering Framework, gives you a nice straightforward way of building this sort of thing. Cool. Oh, yes. And then, of course, 
Um, whenever you get into differential equations, at some point someone in the room puts up their hand and says, hey, can you do chaotic differential equations? Yes, you can do chaotic attractors. It's one of the built-in examples. Tutorial, Lorentz attractor. This is the standard differential equation uh, butterfly network type thing. Um, oh, and I guess we have an example here of setting the random number seed. I'm going to just, you know, just to change, you know, this is going to, that seed there, that's going to change the particular random neurons that I'm creating, um, just to be a little bit more consistent. Um, but this is now the standard differential equation um, for uh, the Lorenz attractor. Well, we've shifted it slightly as it mentions in the text, but it's the same idea. Um, if I go ahead and plot that over a longer window in time, you can see the classic Lorenz attractor. Okay, so this is a pattern. So the idea with these things is this, this is a, a pattern where you know it follows the standard pattern for a while, a standard pattern for a while, and then it has a couple different phases, which which sort of loop it's going on. Um, so it has two different sorts of behaviors, and it's very um, I don't want to say impossible to predict, but uh, um, it's chaotic which one it and ends up going to. So very small changes in the input are going to change which one it goes to. Um, again, though, I will highlight um, that we're only approximating the runs attractor. Um, the, um, hopefully the approximation is close enough. If, you, if it's not close enough, increase the number of neurons. Um, and with smaller numbers of neurons, you can sometimes, let's see if this is an example, um, get, no, oh, all right. With some random numbers, you will sometimes find groups of neurons that do not um, uh, exhibit the chaotic behavior. Okay. Um, but that one seems to be working fine. So, um, yes, so yes, you can implement, as I said, any differential equation. Um, more complex differential equations might need a few more neurons, um, this is, but this is only 600 neurons, um, and certainly you can do it with less. I don't know. Try it with less. <laughs> I, I want to get an example of the of the system failing. It's still doing a pretty good job. Uh, it might be a little bit. Starting to get to a point where you'd actually have to do a bunch of weird math in order to actually figure out is it actually being uh, chaotic or not. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's the sort of clearly pathological behavior. Fine with 50 neurons. This particular random number seed didn't do it. I could probably play around with the random number seed and find one that would work with 50 neurons. Anyway, um, but chaotic attractors, sure, yes, we can do that. All right, um, that was way too much math. Um, but the point of all of that was to say, hey, there is a very important extra thing that we can now do with neurons. Now that we have recurrence, instead of just being able to compute feedforward functions, y is some function of x, um, and then having that restriction that those should be smooth functions or functions without um, really big changes in them, um, instead of saying that's what biological algorithms need to be built up out of, now we can include one extra thing, which is, look, differential equations we can also do. Um, and with a pretty small, um, I've been doing everything in this form, the dx dt is some function of x plus some function of the input. Um, but with a change of variables, you can get um, a differential equation um, uh, across both the variables. And indeed, um, we've seen examples of that already. Um, so we can do differential equations. We have the same sort of restriction that, hey, they shouldn't be too function. The functions shouldn't be too complicated. At least the more complicated the function, the more neurons we're going to need. Um, and the neurons are best at functions that are um, well approximated by low degree polynomials. Um, but that's now a basic component that we can now build. And this is kind of exciting to me because this is sort of like, well, I'm not used to thinking about differential equations to design algorithms. Like no, no one doing cognitive algorithms writes things in terms of differential equations. Well, okay, not no one. No one builds that as sort of a fundamental component. You can also, you can also often have sort of individual parts that are differential equations, but having that as a fundamental component um, that I know neurons are good at, every time you have a recurrent connection, you can do one of these, and recurrent connections exist throughout the brain all the time. Um, this, to me, starts guiding me to think about differential equations more. 
Okay, um, that's it for this part. The next part of this, I'm going to break here and then do an, an extended example of trying to build something, build a, build a model out of these components. That'll be my next example. Thank you very much. See you in a moment.